I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our grand round speaker today, Dr. Christopher, known as Risto Filippi, whom I've known for decades and decades and decades. Um, basically, uh, Risto is currently uh, Alice Edinger and Jack Dreyfus Chair and Professor at Tufts. He did his BA in Johns Hopkins, his MD and his radiology residency in Cornell, and then did neuroradiology fellowship here at Yale from 95 to 97. He then became a chairman. Uh, actually, he went through multiple other jobs. He was chief of neuroradiology at UVM and at Columbia, then was vice chairman of radiology research at Northwell until becoming chairman at Tufts in uh, 2020. He's currently a fellow of the ISMRM, a fellow of the ACR, and a fellow of the American Society of Functional Neuroradiology. He served as president of the American Society of Fe uh, Functional Neuroradiology and has been senior editor of the AJNR and has served on multiple important committees at the ASNR, including the cutting edge AI committee. His work has basically centered mostly around translation of research into abnormal, abnormalities and cutting edge MR technology and applying those techniques into clinical usage. Today, he's going to be talking about the latest advances in the WHO classification of gliomas with some AI research at the end. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Christopher Felipe Risto to Grand Rounds today. Thank you for that incredibly nice introduction. And uh, when I typically uh, give this talk, I say it's really hard to predict things about tumors. Every five years or so, they have another iteration of WHO and everything sort of turns on its head. And, uh, um, and the other sort of thing is like in full disclosure mode, um, let me just get to the advanced main here. How does it advance? Hmm. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Um, I want to make sure I can advance this. Hold on. Use a laptop. Laptop, I did, but which one? Oh, the arrows. Arrows, I did that. It didn't seem to work. Okay, good. I think, okay, yes, he may be able to, he may write code, but he can't handle his keyboard, which is really a sad statement. <laughs> but in the, and I will soon be going to Toronto Sick Kids to be doing sort of research in AI in a more formal way. So uh, migrating to another country. So I would not have predicted that six or seven months ago, but that is the new reality. Um, so these are the only the only relevant disclosures. Let me go back. I have to be a little bit patient with the Mac top is that I will talk about research at the end, some of which relates to this startup company that my former residents and I have been working on for several years. I'm a minority stakeholder in full disclosure, but we will not discuss any product developments. It's just going to be research, uh, pure and simple. Um, what are some of our objectives today? Um, we're gonna review changes in how glioma is diagnosed, which integrate molecular genetic and histologic features with imaging features. And this is something that we've been talking about for 15 years, but with advances in this technology, the genetics and molecular features are, are, are changed significantly. So it's good to review them. We just understand which ones are the most important in making a diagnosis. And this is certainly really relevant for multidisciplinary conferences, right? When we have all that data together. So it's one of those things we wanna incorporate into patients EMR or electronic medical records. We'll focus a lot on adult neoplasm, but we will briefly touch on pediatrics in a way that sort of simplifies that, but we won't be able to talk about all of the new entities that are described in that diagnosis. And at the very end, I do want to have a talk about uh, a little bit about artificial intelligence and ways in which I really think it needs to be developed to sort of make our lives easier as neuroradiologists, and particularly how it relates to patient-centered care, focusing on what patients want to know uh, about their illnesses. So... You know, for a while now, I would say we've had this radiomics and genomics talks and imaging features, and we know that you know histopathologic uh, and molecular features really do impact things. We know that you know oligodendrogliomas have this one p nineteen q code deletion. We know that they have the IDH mutations, which confers a better prognosis. We know that these molecular features also correlate with histopathology. If you have EGFR amplification that's more seen in the classical and mesenchymal GBM histopathologic subtypes, whereas the IDH mutations are more in the neural proneural subtypes. We know that if you have the MGMT promoter uh, mutation, that you're more resistant to the alkylating effects of chemo, but you're more likely to have pseudoprogression on MR follow-up after chemoradiation. 
And we know that certain features enable a more favorable prognosis. For example, if you have the IDH mutations or MGMT mutations, you're going to do better with progression-free survival. And we also know that some uh, molecular features correlate with tumor location, right? That the EGFR amplified tumors are more commonly seen in left temporal lobe, for example. So the overarching goal, especially when we think about precision health uh, and, and on our patients, whether it's adult or pediatric, you really want to integrate all this molecular and genomic data with imaging, histopathology, and clinical data. And it really should be informing patient treatment and management and maybe prognostic information. And we're on the cusp of doing this. So this is why I think those changes in 2021 are relevant. So what makes a glial tumor a glial tumor? Well, the WHO grading for starters, but after 2021, they sort of, you know, no more Roman numerals. You have to use the two, three, four, which really annoys me as someone of Italian heritage. My dad born in Italy, like what's wrong with Roman numerals? Okay, cazzo boy, we'd say in Italian, which don't repeat that sentence, but you know, what's wrong with that? So grade two, hypercellular bland nuclei, diffuse glioma cells. If it's grade three, you start to get anaplasia and nuclear atypia and mitotic figures. And grade four is what you really never want. And that's when you really start to see the angiogenesis, necrosis, microvascular perforation. So let's look at some examples from this nice pathology paper. So clear cytoplasm, monomorphic nuclei, that's a very typical grade two. This happens to be an oligodendroglioma. If you go to this next slide, you have much more atypical nuclei, a mitotic figure. This is more symptom, uh, more characteristic of a grade three anaplastic astrocytoma. And this is something we all recognize for our multidisciplinary conferences. Like, you know, you, even I can recognize pseudopalisating necrosis, right? And you can see the microvascular proliferation in this slide. So this is a grade four glioblastoma. Now, I was really unhappy with the 2016 upgrade because look at it, this is so complicated. This is something you just have to like cut and paste it on your screen for multidisciplinary conference. You can sound intelligent, but there's no way I'm memorizing all that. But now in 2021, it's been really simplified in a way that I can, <laughs> which I like. So now for the adults, you either, you have adult diffuse type glioma, pediatric diffuse type glioma, and then circumscribed astrocytic glioma. Woohoo! And I'm trying to say glioma because in Canada, they say it that way. So I'm trying to adapt uh, in advance of arrival there. So, um, but this slide is really important. I'm happy to share these slides with residents at the end of conference because some of this is really important. And the key is the isocitrate dehydrogenase mutation, IDH1 or IDH mutations. These are mutations above in the Krebs cycle where you co-opt the metabolic energy of the cell and this mutagenesis and you make alpha-2 ketoglutarate and that's not good. And in pediatrics, these histone three mutations are really important. They are the, the four diffuse gliomas that are really lethal in children, all have histone three mutations. The glioblastoma that we think of more classically, what matters in that IDH wild type are, are these three mutations, the EGFR, TERP promoter mutations, and this chromosome anomaly where we have an extra copy of seven and one less of 10. And you also have to worry about 1p19 co deletions just for oligos. And we'll talk about this mutation, which is really important for astrocytomas, because if you possess this, it becomes grade four, regardless of what the histopathology shows. So even if your histopathology looks bland, if you have that mutation, give it time, it becomes grade four. This becomes really important prognostically. So that's the key slide for adults. Just memorize that and you're all good. So now, you know, it's not always so simple in the real world before we can really take off and go, you know, you have this not otherwise specified category when you don't have molecular information available to you. And I worked in rural environments, like forget about it. So sometimes we don't have what we want. Um, Sometimes the diagnostic tests are performed, but the results don't allow for definitive CNS-WHO 2021 diagnosis. So that's problematic. But we want to try to integrate this diagnosis in a meaningful way, combining all the relevant data. So for example, if you had a glioblastoma at each wild type, we want to know, does the EGFR amplify? And what does it have? Necrosis, microvascular perforation. So some kind of EMR reporting like this would be great at the end of a multidisciplinary conference where we discuss tumors. This slide is a little bit busy, but I'm going to go through like uh, all you need to know about the adult classifications so step by step. So the most important thing is whether something is IDH mutant or wild type. And if it's an IDH mutant, we need to know the histology. And then if it has oligodendroglioma features, we go down this pathway. And if it has astrocytic or mixed features, it goes to the right. And the first thing for the oligodendroglioma is you want to know whether there's a 1p19q codeletion. And if that's present, we're good, and on we go. And if there's, then you look at the histopathology. Are there mitoses or nucleotypia? If there are, then it becomes an oligodendroglioma, grade three, IDH mutant, 1p19q co-deleted. 
that's what we want to have somewhere in the chart. And if it's not um, uh, showing you atypia or these other things, then it's just a grade two IDH mutant oligo with that 1P92Q code deletion. Now, if it has astrocytic or mixed features, it's a little bit more uh, challenging. You want to look for P53 mutations, RTX mutations. So let's just assume it doesn't have that. And the first iteration is it doesn't have that. Then you ask, does it have a 1P19Q code deletion? If it doesn't have that, then you get, get sent back to the right. And if those mutations are present, or if you do the other pathway and it's no, no code deletion, then you're going to look at the histopathology. So, and again, it's the same as before. You want to look for the mitosis, necrosis, these things, and that homodeletion mutation you need to sort of factor out. So the, the iterations that are possible on the right-handed side, if it has really no atypia, it's a grade two astrocytoma IDH mutant. If it has a little bit of um, uh, anaplasia or atypia or mitosis, it becomes grade three. And if it has the typical microvascular perforation, necrosis, then it's going to be a grade four. Or if you have that homozygous deletion, regardless of pathology, histopathology, it becomes grade four. And so this is really all that it is, which may be a little bit overwhelming. We're going to put this into practice with some example cases. You can sort of get a flavor for how it works. This is really what we need to know. Now, IDH wild type is easier, uh, you know, and you go straight to the features. Now, the IDH wild type is what we typically associate with the classic, you know, glioblastoma multiforme. We don't use that word anymore. So don't ever say glioblastoma multiforme anymore. Like that's verboten. It's gone. It's passe. Done with it. So we want to just say IDH wild type <laughs> glioblastoma. And you want to look for the histo histologic features and test for those molecular and genetic features. So if you have some of these features present, then it's going to become the glioblastoma, IDH wild type, grade four, and you look for those different features, right? And if you don't have any of these things, then we just call it a diffuse astrocytic glioma, grade four, IDH wild type, with no upstaging features at this time until you can do those other genetic testing. So that's where we stand. So... What's really important here, now that we've gone through all those slides, which you know you can always go back and look at anytime you'd like, the IDH mutation status is by far the key. Mutant versus wild type have very different treatments, very different progression-free and overall survival. No one wants to have an IDH wild type. And glioblastoma is only used for IDH wild type disease. Um, and you know what we used to call an IDH mutant glioblastoma in 2016 is now an astrocytoma IDH mutant grade four. Um, and again, this diffuse astrocytic glioma, that wild type, which doesn't have those upstaging features needed for the glioblastoma that we more typically think of, you just have to wait until other studies are done. And let's look at some examples. So here you have a very classic kind of really ugly looking, non-enhanced infiltrative mass, expansion of left temporal lobe in the uncus, squashing the cerebral peduncle, bad looking. On histopathology, there are no mitoses or anaplasia, and it was an astrocytic tumor, no oligodendral features. And it was an IDH mutant, no co-deletion. So in 2021, the integrated diagnosis is a grade two diffuse astrocytoma IDH mutant. And that's how you put all those little things together. Boom, and there we have it. So this is what the neuro-oncologists want to know. Uh, and here's another example, a young adult in their 20s, chronic headaches and recent seizure prompting this emergent brain study. You can see this really ugly looking calcified mass, a lot of mass-like abnormality, a greater extent of disease with T2 prolongation, focal mass effect and cystic change, and again, swelling of the left uh, anteromedial temporal lobe, right? And here you have some T1 shortening, probably from calcifications, but there's some subtle enhancement. And again, no increased diffusivity. And again, DWI is your best friend. If it is really, if there's a lot of reduced diffusivity or high signal, really dark in the ADC map, that really implies high grade, especially in children, pediatrics. Just remember that. Um, now, in the molecular studies for this particular patient, it was IDH mutant, 1P19Q co-deleted, and there was an oligodendroglioma features with mitoses and atypia. So this becomes an oligodendroglioma. It is grade three IDH mutant with a 1P19Q co-deletion. So you can put all those pieces together, and that's the W2021 WHO integrated diagnosis. And uh, whoops, let's go back and talk a little bit about the um, T2 flare mismatch sign. And so this is really 100% specific, but it's not so sensitive for the IDH mutant, which is non 1P90Q co deleted astrocytoma, but this is talked a lot about. And you have to sort of uh, uh, you know be cautious about it because here you might think there's like this mismatch sign, but it's only partially mismatched because laterally you have both T2 and flare hypointense signal. Uh, and there's a dot of enhancement post-contrast. 
So this is not really the classic, and this diagnosis was diffuse astrocytoma, grade three IDH mutant antihistopathology. So if you have a TT flare mismatch, it's great, but it's really in my practice, it's, there's more exceptions to that rule of being positive. So it's great when you see it, but I don't see it that often. Um, and let's go back to this other case. Remember this one, the 2021 integrated diagnosis we had just recently. So now that patient comes back in three years and we have trouble. We have like a ring enhancement. We've got some uh, reduced diffusivity peripherally. And on resampling that lesion, there's now microvascular perforation, necrosis, and anaplasia. It's still IDH mutant astrocytic tumor, but now it's high grade, which we'd formerly call glioblastoma. So this is really a 2021 diffuse astrocytoma grade four IDH mutant. And that's the big change for us and for neuro-oncology. And another example, right frontal lobe, again, you know, it doesn't look so bad. It looks relatively well marginated. There's not a lot of reduced diffusivity. There may be a little bit of peripheral enhancement. You know, there is elevated RCBD, which we don't really like. Uh, it does not have MGMT promotion, no EGFR amplification, no mitosis or anaplasia, but it's positive for that bad deletion that we talked about. So it doesn't matter how relatively benign this looks like, it is going to be a grade four tumor. So this is the important lesson. Like if you have that one mutation, it doesn't matter how, but like there's no surrounding edema, it's so well marginated. And you would think this is lower grade, but you would be wrong. So this is like a high grade four lesion that they'll treat much more aggressively. So this is like one of the new permutations, which are important when you have new, when your neuro, neuro tumor board or integrated multidisciplinary conference, you wanna be aware of that. So what is this? It's a cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor. It encodes these proteins, which are tumor suppressors. And if you have a homozygous deletion, it's independent risk factor, poor prognosis. And this is just the prevalence of that deletion in different grades of tumors. It's not that prevalent. So it's relatively uncommon. And it's just showing you a nice paper of like the decline in your overall survival when you have that homozygous deletion of the CDKN2A B uh, wild type. So that's that's not great. So let's look at some other you know practice cases. Now this of course really looks like a bad actor, right? Because you have this you know uh, mass-like abnormality. It's trying desperately to cross from the left into the right hemisphere across the corpus callosum. and there has some susceptibility, so hemorrhage and/or calcification a lot of necrosis centrally, peripheral ring enhancement. And we tell you that it's a wild type uh, and they're pseudopalisating necrosis. So we want to give an, an, and look at that lovely RCB elevation in the periphery where it's not necrotic. And this is like the classic uh, glioblastoma, IDH wild type, grade four with both p mutations and EGFR amplification. These things are determined by genetic analysis. But the point of that sort of nice integrated diagnosis. It's really more for the EMR. We don't expect you to dictate on your report, something like that, right? But it's just, this is when you have a multidisciplinary conference is the information we'd want to eventually get into that EMR. Um, now for kids, um, it's a little, it, you know, we will go through this and, and highlight it. The big thing is that the high grade gliomas, there are four entities which have a shared histology with a lot of necrosis and microvascular perforation. And all of them have a molecular histone alteration this H3 alteration. So you can have a diffuse midline glioma. That's typically the former DIPG, diffuse int intrinsic punting glioma, that kind of flavor. It's really this H3 K27M altered tumor. There's a diffuse hemispheric glioma, G34 mutant, infant type hemispheric glioma, and really young kids of several months. And there is a diffuse pediatric type of high grade glioma, which is both H3 wild type and IDH wild type. That's the only four entities for high grading kids you ever need to know. On the other side, there are a lot of low-grade gliomas in children, and they all are identified by these genetic markers. These are all new. So, you know, when these came out, people were just like, eyes sort of bulge out of their head, like, how much can I possibly learn? And your idea is just to have this set up by your workstation. So when they come to ask a question, you have easily at your fingertips. It's like lifelong learning. So, but you can have a diffuse astrocytoma, which is M -O -M -O -M -Y -M -Y MYB altered. There's this new entity called the Plenty tumor, polymorphous low-grade neuropathelial tumor of the young angiocentric glioma, and you have diffuse low-grade glioma, which are MAPK alter, which either be alindodendroglioma morphology or astrocytic morphology. So this is all you need to know about the PEDS. And the other tumors are well-circumscribed lesions, which we all know well, like the pilocytics, the SEGA lesions, the XPAs, and choroidal gliomas. But this is really the big glial demarcation between low-grade, four things, high-grade, four things, that's it. It is simplified. It's better than 2016. And you know, the age of the kid matters, location, all these things for the integrated diagnosis, but we don't use glioblastoma any longer in children. Uh, that termination is now gone. 
So again, these little rules, but you know, this is how, and then wait until 2026, you know, I may be retired, but then there'll be new rules and it'll be left up to one of you to give this talk. So here are two examples of this new entity called Plenty with MAPK alterations with oligodendroglioma-like features, variable morphology, and they typically occur in the temporal lobe. They can be calcified, again, another lesion. You know, they don't look all that aggressive, right? It's sort of like this abnormal T2 prolongation, slight expansion, no enhancement, no reduced diffusivity. And the, the basic features here, it's a WHO1, very low-grade lesion. Uh, uh, MAPK stands for mitogen-activated protein kinase. Median age for this is adolescence, like teenager years, slight female predominance. And it's usually both cortical slash subcortical and supratentorial temporal lobe predominance, like two thirds of the cases uh, and variable signal with calcifications. And this is like, uh, and, and that differential for kids with epilepsy or, or chronic seizures. And if you have a mass lesion, this is what you should think about this kind of tumor. Um, and here's another one, again, um, a very well marginated lesion sitting right in the motor strip, really close to hand, right? And you have like a little bit of abnormal signal, no enhancement, it looks really benign. And I will tell you that if I showed you a diffusion sequence that was really, really dark on the ADC map, you would be thinking more about an embryonal supertentorial carcinoma with YAP, or YAP mutations. Those things are really aggressive and malignant. So had this shown really bright signal on DWI, I would say it's a high grade tumor and you need to get it out. So that's just the only caveat that in kids, anything that's bright on diffusion is really high grade, period. There's really nothing, no mimic there. So that's really an important point to take home. Um, and these tumors, again, are very low grade. This MYB is an alternation in this transcription regulator for dedifferentiation of cells. Median age here is much younger, no sex predominance. And again, a very cortical, juxtacortical location, usually deep white matter and some, or gray nuclei cortex, these areas. And again, really nonspecific. It just looks a little infiltrative sometimes or well marginated, abnormal T2 signal, no enhancement, no diffusion redu reduction. So again, um, just you would think low grade glial tumor. And the last one we're gonna show is another sort of, again, temporal lobe location. You know, these are the kinds of things we see not uncommonly in pediatric practice. These like leaves, like, what is this? And yeah, it's mass-like, it's well marginated, has a normal T2 signal, no enhancement. You have to worry it's a low grade glial tumor and they have to do genetic testing when they take the thing out to see what, what are the mutations involved. This is MAPK altered. And again, a really rare low grade tumor. Again, this is an oncogene and it can have these mixed features of both oligodendrogliomas and astrocytes. And again, kids often present with epilepsy. And again, non-specific imaging findings, but this cortical location, juxtacortical location, temporal lobe feature. So there's something in common with all these low-grade glial tumors in kids with a new, with a new WHO classification. Um, so let's talk about the high-grade ones. So like in 2016, if this was a child, we would have said this was an anaplastic astro, grade three IDH wild type. That's what it was called. But now if we use the new you know, when we come back now and reassess this with 2021, we'd actually call this, you know, they test it now years later, and it's actually a histomutation. It's this H3G3 or this histomutation diffuse hemispheric a grade four. So this is the new thing. This is why for pediatric tumors, we have to test for all these different histomutations because the therapy will differ depending on the mutation that is involved. And in particular, for the next case, um, you know, this looks like what we used to call the diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, right? And now it's really this, and it's not just that it was altered before, but now we give it a grade. This is grade four by definition. So this is going to get much more aggressive therapy. And it's important actually to recognize this entity. Uh, it can occur outside the pediatric age group because there's a monoclonal antibody clinical trial, which has extended the life survival in these patients from nine to 12 months. And that may not seem like a lot to you, but we'll get to this story in just a second. I think narratives are really good. Here's an example of an interhemispheric glioma in a kid. And this is, this is like, you know, almost looks like the decimal plastic infantile ganglioglioma, but this is a really big, ugly lesion with cysts and solid components and edema and mass effect, really ugly looking lesion. Um, and this is also a really rare high grade tumor. And again, this tyrosine kinase receptor gene functions that, that, that get mutated really confer an oncogenic property to a lot of tumors. This happens in very, very young kids. Overall survival is not great. And it's usually in these large cerebral hemispheres. So those are, that's just like some examples of the high grade pediatric glioma subtypes. Now, I like this case because I think it's a cautionary tale, uh, true story. So these sort of diffuse midline gliomas can happen in adults. We think about them as a pediatric diagnosis, but these can occur in young adults, even middle-aged adults, albeit rare. So this is a case, middle-aged guy presenting with months of crescendo headache, and he came to the ER, clearly there's a mass lesion, he got an MRI. 
Uh, and so you have this abnormal lesion, brainstem, expand sile, a dot of reduced diffusivity, which is never good. Like that is not, that is not good. That makes me very nervous when I see a dot of reduced diffusivity, that's going to be something high grade and bad. Um, and there's a little bit of enhancement. And I think I was, a, I think I was away visiting my wife in Serbia for like three weeks. So I was right. gone and it was presumed to be a high grade glioblastoma started on chemo radiation um, and no biopsy was done. The, uh, this patient's uh, partner is actually a chair at an institution uh, that I know and uh, asked for a second opinion and they suggested getting a biopsy. When I came back, they asked me what I would do and they showed me these cases. They showed me this case. My first thought was it's like a diffuse midline glioma. And I know in New York City, we'd be aggressive when we would definitely biopsy this because if there's a histone mutation, you get on the monoclonal antibody therapy. So this was sent to New York City for, uh, you know, far from Boston. Uh, diagnosis was diffuse midline glioma, H3, K27 altered, and he's on the clinical trial for the vaccine. And as I think had six or seven months of regression-free survival, why does it matter? He's got two young kids. So nine months means everything in the world to a patient, right? So and anyone did this room, if you were given like a diagnosis of 12 months, you get an extra 12 months, you would take it probably. So these things matter. So we have to really be cognizant of, you know, not everything is a high grade glial tumor. If it looks like a DIPG in an adult, you better be thinking midline glioma and make sure they get the the appropriate biopsy. Okay. The last thing in kids, I'm going to switch to some AI stuff because I love AI. Uh, <laughs> um, these are the kind of nice cases because these are sort of easier to swallow. <laughs> They're easier to manage because these are the really well-defined astrocytic gliomas. They have really good marginated borders, you know, and a lot of these, you know, so well already, we won't spend too much time, but the pilocytic tumors, I think I actually showed one to the fellows. We may see the same case again. The SEGA lesions that you see with tuberous sclerosis kids, right? The subependable giant cell astrocytomas. PXAs are very classically seen in adolescents with seizure disorders. That is almost a pilocytic appearance with an enhancing neural nodule. We'll look at one of those. Um, astroblastomas and, and one altered and then high grade astrocytomas with pyloid features. These are the six entities. That is it. Uh, and there are some other entities that occur in kids like MBNTs we're not going to talk about today. But here's a classic example large supercellular lesion, not reduced diffusivity, intense enhancement, and already leptomeningeal seeding and CSF seeding. This is really very classic of a pilomyxoid astrocytoma considered WHO uh, grade two. Uh, and it's a subvariant of pilocytic tumors. These you have to kind of treat with sort of aggressive surgery. You want to get gross total resection. That's the best chance for cure. There are a bunch of different chemo options out there. These are all clinical trials because if it starts to seed the CSF or re recurs locally, your progression-free survival is limited, and we don't know yet what overall survival impacts that may be, because it was recently described at Hopkins in like 2008, 2009. So it's only been around for like less than 15 years. Um, now here's a more classic PXA or pleomorphic xanthogromic uh, astrocytoma. Again, WHO grade one. This is like the best classic example. Like it's like this little nodule. It enhances, not a lot of edema. You know, you take this out, you know, your, your epilepsy is cured. So this is really a uh, if you have to have a tumor, this might not be a bad one to have as long as you're non-dominant hemisphere, non-dominant hemisphere that is. And the last sort of like well circumscribed entity I'm going to show you is this astroblastoma and, and one altered. And it typically presents as this lobular mass with enhancement and punctate calcifications. But, you know, this is differential. You know, you could think if I were reading this out, I'd be like, you know, it could be low grade glial, it could be oligo. You just have to give a differential. You're going to have to wait for this topology to answer on this. This is not, not, that doesn't, it's not pathognomonic when you look at this, just that cautionary tale. All right, so let's get to AI for the last half. Um, it can be overwhelming, all those changes, but it's just important for you if you're dealing with neuro-oncology, neurosurgeons, neurologists, to be able to speak their language because they know about these mutations. They know how that's going to shunt treatment. So you have to be able to engage in that conversation. So if I'm looking at a pediatric case, I think like, yeah, that's diffuse midline glioma of some kind or hemispheric glioma. I worry about it because it has the reduced diffusivity. High signal on DBY, it's high grade. It's gonna be one of these four types because it's in the posterior FOS. I favor, you know, the, the H3K27 thing. If it's gonna be the H3G34 thing, you know, it's gonna be super tentorial. So you have to really sort of you can you can actually come up with a pretty sophisticated differential. And it's about having street credibility, right? And just knowing that the IDH mutation is the most important. So you can sort of talk that talk or ask the right questions. So if you're being shown a case on the fly, like, okay. It looks like a really ugly glial tumor, but what's the IDH mutation status, right? Because if it's mutant, you're going to think about something different. If it's going to be wild type, you think about something different. So it's good to have those things in your head. Um, now, I want AI to do all that for us. We're going to talk about that. Like why, you know, 
I want AI to be augmenting my intelligence because, you know, I'm getting older. I have MCI maybe. So, you know, I really want this program to save me, you know, and I know that that's my dog and that's Mount Fuji and a snowflake. And I don't really need help from AI to tell me that that's an abscess or a tumor or an MS plaque. What I want it to tell me is whether that tumor has like an IDH mutation, 1P19 code lesion or amplification of GGFR, or is it an MGMT promoter? Or can it tell me what's the survivability probability of less than six months or more than 24 months? I wanted to give me information that it can harness from the power of all those MR voxels, millions of them. And think about it, you have millions of voxels in every MR image and small little differences are amazingly st statistically significant. So if you have an AI program comb combing over those voxels and all those MR images, you can come up with some powerful predictors. And this is how, this is my favorite gift. Oh, wait, is it coming up? Yeah, this is me at work. You know, we are so busy, you know? <laughs> we need to make making double our salary and give them much more time off because we're so stressed all the time. And, um, you know, and you know what would really help me the most is uh, segmentation. So, uh, you know, this is a, such a complicated topic. We'll save a lot of it for later, all my soapboxing. But in essence, you know, it is very frustrating. We have tons of free software that can automatically segment volume of enhancement, volume of necrosis, and volume of edema. It should be spit out on our reports automatically and just sent to the packs. And, you know, companies just don't want to invest in that because they don't care about making our time life more easier. They don't care about my efficiency. They care about other things. But this would be a great help to patients. So from patient-centered experience, this should be a developed product. In my humble opinion, this is a great paper that talks about this. Like, right? Like, you can, you can do a you know, you can do these sort of, what I want is something like this on the right, these automated random measurements for all these clinical trials we do, get the maximum length and width. Like this is something that a, a software program could do today if we just need to sort of validate this sort of multi-institutional trial. And that's sort of the, the kicker is that for these things to be really incorporated into a routine clinical practice, we have to have some sort of multi-institutional corroboration that they're good. And we have to be the ground truth. And when you're ground truth, it's expensive, right? Because like we as radiologists have to ground truth these things and it has to happen after hours. So it's really hard to do some of this. And we can talk about that in a little bit as well. Uh, and this is what I feel like, you know, it's like just we're so close to getting these tools that we desperately need to be more efficient and better, but it's not quite ready for prime time. And part of the problem may be more like this slide, you know, like this is what I call the hedonistic curves. Maybe I'm a little bit hedonistic and want too much, you know, pleasure in my life, but you know, the more I do AI, the more I do segmentation stuff, I want more. And then it turns out that I, I strive to have all these tools. Once I start getting them, I start really liking them, I adapt them, and then I want more. And it just goes around and around and around. So maybe I'm part of that cycle problem there, just wanting too much too quickly and all the time. And I'm never satisfied. But no, we need to start somewhere with some basic segmentation, I would argue. Um, I want to showcase the work of former residents. It's really important. And this is like a multi-center collaboration in Columbia and Cornell long before AI was on anybody's radar. People thought we were crazy, but we wanted to look at this tumor cancer imaging archive. We looked at patients with both higher grade and low grade gliomas. We had these different sequences, flare, T2, pre and post contrast. We really wanted to predict IDH mutation status, this 1P19Q co-deletion status, whether they had the MGMT promoter region and what survival was. And this was, an, this was sort of the uh, architecture of the code. And I won't get into too many details, but we can talk offline or after the lecture about this, it was a generative adversarial network. This is the really common convolutional neural network that's really a big deal now in AI. And if you don't know what a GAN is, the, the easiest way to explain this is that it's like counterfeiting money. Not that I have experience in counterfeiting, but if I were, you would have a discriminator and a generator. And it, and it really comes from game theory. You have these two CNNs competing with one another to make the best model. And one is the generator making lots of models and the discriminator decides like, okay, that fits best. So it's sort of like me making a lot of fake counterfeit bills. When I can finally fool the teller that Chase Manhattan Bank, I win. So this is how it kind of works, similar conceptually. Um, and this data is really noisy and not great. It's just sort of dumped for free in this big repository and different MR vendors, different magnetic field strengths, different protocols, slice thickness, you name it. There's a lot of stuff and you have to sort of do a little bit of pre-processing, but it's really, so we didn't think that this would work. We thought it was gonna be a negative study. And it worked really, really well. So clear that AI picks up on things that we don't know. It was really good for detecting IDH mutation status, even MGMT, and it took five seconds total. Now, um, the interesting thing is you can go back. And so I think I'm gonna show you some pictures of what the computer said was IDH mutant and wild type. And I guess there are some differences with it was the IDH mutated, maybe it had more cystic features, maybe more solid T2 prolongation, but I don't know. 
we went, you can actually reverse engineer your convolutional neural network. So don't let people tell you it's a black box. That's actually not true. You can actually go in and find out from your model what was weighted to be the most important. When we asked that question of the model, the single most important thing was actually, anyone had to make a guess, like what was the most important thing on the image to tell what whether something was an IDH mutant or not? It was not intuitive to me at the time and it changed how I look at images. So it just shows you that, you know, AI can augment your intelligence. Any wild guesses? Do not be embarrassed. You're among friends. I'm a former Yaley from 97. So you'd say it won't be held against you. That's a great idea. It wasn't what it said, but I think I like that idea, right? Like how much that was, it's sort of implying if there's greater permeability, maybe there's more enhancement hanging around, maybe correlate with that mutation. So that's actually a good thought. I'll just tell you in the interest of time. It was actually the heterogeneity of flare signal on flare and peritumoral edema. And if you really now look, every time you have a scan, if you look at a metastatic lesion, that edema is like pure water. Look at a glioblastoma the next time. It's not, there's a lot of heterogeneity of signal in that flare and presumably that's infiltrating tumor cells. So I challenge you all to go have a good look at that next time. And this is what the model said was really predictive by IDH mutation status, at least for the ones that we gave it. So that to me was really interesting. So now I look a lot more carefully at peritumoral edema. Same thing with the MGMT promoters. These to me look identical. There's just no way. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. And, and for this, what mattered most were the MGM, uh, MD, the model said like basically the expansion, the cortical expansion with T2 prolongation was more important than the model. So what I like is this work from UCSF. The problem with that we soon discovered after several years is that, look at this, they're all these mutation pathways, you know? So it gets really complicated really quickly. Luckily for the WHO, they're focused on IDH mutation. And that we can pretty reliably tell in the preoperative MRI image. And, and you may think, well, why does that matter? It matters a lot. So if I tell the neurosurgeon I have an IDH mutant tumor, they're gonna be much more aggressive about GTR, cross total resection. If an IDH wild type, they'll debulk it, but they're not gonna go crazy. It's already wild type and probably grade four. So it does matter to their surgical approach. You can shunt them into a clinical trial right away, right? So these things really can expedite patient care. So being able to tell them that, and I feel confident with our AI that we can really do IDH mutation status upfront preoperatively. The MGMT, I don't think so. There's been too much disparity in the literature about how to approach that. And that's maybe an unsolvable problem. But I like this idea of being able to do something like this. Now, what I really like is something like this as a future product to actually be able to have a, an image through the maximum width of a tumor and come up with probabilities for certain mutations. Just sort of spit it out there. And I could just say like in my report, yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, this lesion, if I were dictating out D and say, yep, it's like 98% probable an IDH mutant tumor. I mean, that would be really kind of cool preoperatively, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I think this is really great. Uh, this comes from a group in Korea, which this to me is like the pie in the sky. I would love to have a PAX program where it takes the image of the maximum tumor and it saves them the same sort of sequence image. But this means doing the image the exact same way every single time, but having like pre-op RT planning, then showing me the eight images that were used in the model prediction, this, you know, information about the patients, MGAT methylated, it's wild type, age, how much RT was given, and they give a probability for progressive disease based on that nodule of enhancement or whatever. I think that's really useful and kind of cool. This needs a lot of validation, but it's just, you know, aspirational. I like to think high and big picture or something like this, where, you know, after, 2020, you know, after almost, you know, 220 days, this area of enhancement, you know, age, mutation status, wild type, unmethylated, RT, and the probability of progressive disease is like 99%. I probably would have said the same, but it's just nice to have this extra sort of model. Like, wouldn't that be great to make our lives so much better? Like that was a total value add. There are a lot of startup companies like this one given to me by a friend. You know, you could do all kinds of segmentation, do like preoperative edema, necrosis, postoperative, and do these graphs. Like you have these graphs, you can follow these things over time. And maybe that somehow informs treatment planning. We don't know because those studies have to be done yet, but I think that's a great direction. Now, metastatic disease is much more common than a primary glial tumor. So if we really want to make advances or headway, it may focus, it may be better, we may be better served by focusing on intracranial metastatic disease because this is so common. And I don't know about you, but uh, it's really hard. You know, you're really busy. Have this, you know, we have these SPGR T1 images, like, you know, <laughs> 
so many in three different planes. You're looking for all these little one millimeter micromets. It is really time consuming. And it's hard because we're like pressured in our life. We have so many things on our cube. It's really hard to sort of step back and really, you know, be Buddha Zen-like and just focus on finding Mets, you know? So if I do these things, I like to do 12 Mets cases in a row. So I'm all focused on just Mets and one thing, but I would love an AI program. And there are a lot of groups working hard on this to try to identify intracranial metastases and to segment them. So you have a volume of disease. Why does it matter? Because, you know, nowadays it's like, I always, th it's not really the wild, wild west. It feels that way to me, but the you know, people doing gamma knife surgery, they'll do 50 lesions. You could have 50 intracranial mets. They'll gamma knife every single one of them. So you have to follow those over time. And so we have to think about a way to do that that's efficient, that puts the patient first. Like what is best for that patient would be to have an automated software that tracks those lesions in real time and not me looking at comparison images because I don't have that bandwidth and I'm not going to be as good as that computer, right? Because if I, let's be honest, like if I look at images I imaged and did measurements for two years ago, I sometimes can't replicate my own measurements because it's just, you know, you're just not so careful sometimes, right? Whereas the computer would be perfect all the time. All right. What about prognosis? You may think like, why does this matter? It does matter, actually. Um, you know, there are patients we know have high-grade glial tumors who do very poorly and die really quickly despite appropriate care and intervention. There are others who really go really, really long, more than two years. We actually have a cohort of really long-term grade four glial tumor or high-grade surviving more than 24 months. And so we did this study to try to figure this stuff out. When we had a CNN model and factored in Karnofsky score, tumor volume, age, location, we could 80% predict who would live more than 24 months, who would live less than six months. Why would that matter? Well, I mean, it, it affects decisions. Like, you know, if you, if you knew you, if you were like 80% probably had less than six months to live, it might alter things differently. There's a 20% chance you might surpass that, but it's an interesting thing. If this could get up to the 95th percentile, I think you would have different conversations with patients. Like for me personally, having members of my family die of glioma, blastoma, I'd be like, no, thank you. I've, I've seen what that looks like. If I have six months and you're telling me 95% probability, I'm not gonna be around in seven months. Thank you very much. I'll go to Vermont and take my little 20 pills and be done with it because we have a nice right to die law there. So I think this is where it kind of matters, but more importantly, it matters for like just normal treatment planning. If I tell you like, this program says you have a 95% chance of living more than 24 months. I'd be like, give me everything you've got and be aggressive, like kill it, right? So I think it really does inform management in a meaningful way and maybe we'll get there. All right, and here's an example of good and poor survival. Here I actually felt like, yeah, if it looks more necrotic, it's really bad. I mean, that's sort of, here's where the model sort of matched my own intuition a little bit. Um, now, a few challenges and opportunities and we're sort of wrap things up and you can have questions, please feel free. You know, we talk a lot about convolutional neural networks, which is deep learning. And, you know, you need a lot of data sets to make this stuff work and a lot of labeled examples. And that has historically been challenged -ing for us in the field of AI research because it's hard to get data share arrangements with different institutions. They can be a bit proprietary, but there are developing networks. The BRATS challenge has been very good. And we also have this nice one for pediatrics or children's brain tumor networks. There are these data sets that are out there. So if you wanted to develop a your own sort of computer program, machine learning thing, or a deep learning CNN program, a generative adversarial network program or whatever, you can access this data. It's freely available. If you wanted to, let's say, do something for Alzheimer's, ADNI is available, Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's. So big data sets are out there that you could use. Um, the multiple imaging societies have these challenges. The RSNA has been really spearheading this, doing really great work. They have the glioma challenge, the intracranial hedge challenge. So that these challenges are great because they'll have like 10,000 cases uh, for you to access. You know, they are hard to do because it's the really the ground truth validation has to come from radiologists and that takes time. So for example, you know, I'm working for the company's uh, research project trying to detect clot, you know, LVO at the M2 segment level. So I'm looking at 600 CTAs. It's just taking me four ever you know and, and it's like a little crazy but you know you need if i'm the ground truth i have to be perfect we're training a computer that can be making a clinical product that could you know influence someone's life so this is this is the hard part about it um and i think for imaging protocols one of the things that drives one of the things that does drive me crazy and one of my things i'll be focused on in toronto since i'm going to be doing ai research is i want to standardize protocols like you need to have the same MR protocol done every single time on that field strength magnet everywhere in your network. The brain MR should be the same. That standardization is key because it enables better AI research. And it's probably better for patient care. 
I'll get off that soapbox. That is a something that really drives me crazy with a capital K. Um, you know, and I think it's really this collaboration with academic medical centers is hard, but there are ways to do it. So for example, if I develop an algorithm, I can say, hey, Jason, I'm going to give it to you, put it behind your firewall and have at it and just tell me what your results are. That's a way to circumvent all these data sharing agreement things. Federated networks are a way to do it. And the ACR Data Science Institute has a bunch of tools. So there's there are things out there. I'm not going to talk about AI fairness. It's another talk, but you have to make sure you have gender balance and underrepresented groups, right? Uh, and sometimes it can vary on disease. Like sometimes disease prevalence is a little bit different, but you have to do your best. And you want to make sure your AI program is explainable. Like I can go to someone and say that IDH mutation is because they're looking at peritumoral flare heterogeneity signal as a, a major factor driving the model. What we don't know, and this is a big thing for like chairs to deal with, which I don't relish that headache anymore having, but how do you evaluate the clinical efficacy? How do you define that? What's the value add for the institution? How do you pay for it? What are the metrics? Because eventually there's data drift and you have to have QI and QA because eventually that model is not going to work as well. So how do you make sure it's still working well? And Mass General has a nice advisory board where they have their own data that they have in some repository and they periodically just go or pull that data and check on the AI that they've been using. So there are solutions that are out there. I recommend if you're thinking about those things, you can use the Mass General model. I think it works very, very well. They have relevant stakeholders in both clinical, IT, research and they really do a pretty good job and you know if they test out an ai software that they buy they test it on their saved data if it's good enough they'll try it out if it doesn't work in their institution they they give it back after 90 days so you can demand the same courtesy wherever you are all right and we want there to be a value add and patient centered okay so just to review these two slides you know i had glioma the three big categories the astrocytoma idh mutant the oligo IDH mutant 1P19Q co-deleted and the glioblastoma is an IDH wild type. And the main molecular driver, again, the IDA, the uh, this, this homozygous deletion, whenever you have it, you're a grade four. Um, and these different amplifications for epidermal growth factors just were associated with the tumor angiogenesis, the P-TERP mutation, uh, and this chromosome deletion all confer wild type in grade four. This mismatch sign, if you see it, it's great, but it's not so sensitive. And the main molecular driver in kids is that H histone three gene mutation. And most well-marginated gliomas are benign and curable, but high-grade astrocytomas with pyeloid features can be a little bit more difficult as well as the pyelomyxoid tumors. Um, and this is the other thing too, we try our best, but other than that mismatch sign, it's really hard to correlate imaging findings with a specific molecular abnormality. So we just do our best and we wait to get the genetics back and then we can make a better integrated diagnosis on the EMR. All these things may factor into it, but this is really the goal. And it's really good for patient care is to sort of correlate as much data as we can, but that takes place at that venue of the multidisciplinary conference, which I can't speak more highly about. And, and that's all I have, so thank you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free, because there's a lot of data thrown at you. You can ask anything about AI stuff and the neuro-oncology space. There's a lot of work in that area. We're still very active, so I leave that to any of you, but thanks.